Welcome everyone. My name is Dawn Henwood. Thanks very much for joining today. Uh, I'm a communications consultant based in Halifax. I notice many of you are in either Halifax or Bedford today as well. And my specialty is working with folks like you, folks who deal in very complex information and ideas and have to figure out how to communicate simply and clearly with people who may or may not share their level of technical expertise. And of course, email is one of the day-to-day -day activities where this difficulty of kind of translating technical know-how into very simple, clear communication often comes up. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. We are going to have a session that is going to be as interactive as possible given our technical constraints. So you'll notice, and I know some of you have already used it, that we have a chat window open. And as I go along, I would encourage you to please use that anytime something resonates with you, you can indicate that. Uh, anytime you say, hmm, that doesn't make sense, please let me know that as well. In addition, I will at certain points be actually asking you for some input. I have included some actual writing samples in this deck that I'd like us to look at together. And so there will be an opportunity for you to participate uh, by chat. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, where does this title come from? Engineering Effective Email. I'm sorry, I can't resist a good pun. I think that uh, writing emails and what you do day to day in the technical part of your job, uh, those are two very similar activities. And here's why. Engineering is, from my layperson's point of view, essentially about solving problems by creating sophisticated solutions. Writing is the same. And even when you are writing something as simple as a, as a short email, it involves that same kind of design process. Now, the trouble is that we don't always see the parallels between these two kinds of activities. Uh, in the interest of saving time, so we think, we often short circuit the writing process and we overlook the fact that like engineering, writing is about design. So let me illustrate this point with just a really simple example. Imagine that you need a new faucet for your kitchen sink. I told you it would be a very simple example. So that's a problem and it's a very easy fix, you think. So you hop in your vehicle, you head off to Kent, you grab an off-the-shelf faucet because it claims to be a universal fit. Uh, but the trouble is that when you get home, you actually discover that that universal uh, faucet doesn't fit the really snazzy looking sink that you have. Uh, so as a result, you know, you're trying to, to jam on the faucet. There's water spurting everywhere. Your spouse is getting upset. The whole thing's a disaster, right? because you didn't need a universal templated, we might say, solution to your problem. You actually needed a specially engineered solution, one that was designed to solve your particular problem to fit your situation. Well, too often, this is what happens with email writing. In the interest of saving time, uh, we tend to think that we can just maybe send some boilerplate or that we don't really have to think thoughtfully about what we are putting in an email. I mean, after all, is an email just like talking to somebody almost? It's kind of just one step up from texting, isn't it? Well, not quite. Um, unless you are in a, a marketing or a sales role and you are sending certain kinds of messages in that situation, most of the communication situations that you're going to face day to day really are bound to be unique. And that means that there's no one size fits all solution. There's no template. You need an engineered solution. And that means what you need essentially is a design process. 
Now, writing should be user-centered design. And in fact, this concept of user-centered design always seems to me a little bit redundant because really if your user isn't at the center of your design, then what's the point? You know, design is very much about making something work for somebody to help them solve a problem, to help them perform a task. So if your user isn't at the center of the design, can we even say it's a genuine design process? So here's the question that I would ask you this afternoon. When you think about your emails, and I'm going to bet that who wrote an email this morning? That's what I'd like to know. Maybe you could use a little hand icon to tell me if you've written an email today. Uh, so just think back. Okay, thank you, James. Sarah, I see a few. Yeah, okay. I think most of us have written at least one email today. Think back to that email. Who was at the center of it? Now, Megan's already written 10. Good for you. <laughs> Signs that you might actually be putting yourself in the center of the email design process are these. You may find that your emails take a long time to write because you find yourself worried about the reaction you're going to get, about the noise that they uh, could produce. You may find that your messages get ignored or that you get only half a reply to them. So maybe you asked for something in particular and you get kind of something that's obliquely related coming back as a response. You spend more time thinking about what you'll say than about how you'll say it. That's definitely a sign that maybe your design process is not user-centered, but writer-centered. And finally, this is a really quick scan that you can do over some of your emails. If your message includes a lot of sentences that start with I, then that could be a sign that you're putting yourself at the center of the design process, not your user who is your reader. So sentences that say, I would like to arrange a meeting, or I wanted to tell you that, those, those are signals to pay attention to. So today, we're going to hit on these three points. We're going to examine writing as a design process. And this is a very agile design process, I would say. So this is not about slowing down. It's not about adding work to your day. It's actually about simplifying the email process by looking at it through the lens of design. We're going to look at some special design considerations that come up with email writing. And then we're going to look at five common mistakes. Um, I do have some writing samples in this deck and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I'll also, at the end of this presentation, give you my email so that if you would like a copy of this deck that includes all of the writing samples, then you can uh, email me and I'll get them to you right away. So what does it mean to think about writing as a design process? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with something like this. It comes in many different flavors, I know. But when I think of a typical design process, uh, whether you are designing a, a garbage can or a bridge or something in between, there tend to be a number of steps here, right? So you start with some kind of inquiry, trying to figure out what it is your user needs. So that might involve a lot of interviewing, it might involve research, it's all kinds of different ways that you really try to wrap your head around what the problem is you're trying to solve. And then there's a kind of imagination phase or step where you're envisioning, envisioning what the ideal solution looks like. Then once you have that vision, you can start planning and then you can start building it. You know, maybe there's a, a prototype initially. So you create it and then you test it, right? And this becomes a cyclical thing if you're working in an agile way. So that's what the typical design process looks like. Uh, feel free in the chat to add in any steps that you include in your design process that maybe aren't here. This is a very simplified version, so I'd love to hear if there are particular uh, steps that you would include. But what I've noticed about many uh, writers, um, particularly from your profession, is that very often that design process gets short-circuited. And so the typical writing process 
starts with planning, which might look like an outline, and then we create. And then, oh, if we're really lucky and, and, and we're feeling that we have some spare time, ha ha, then we might actually do the testing and the revising and the iterating. So very often what should be a cycle, as in a design, true design process, uh, becomes just this very linear one or two or three step process. So what, um, what you can do to instantly improve your writing, including your email writing, is to think of it as more of that kind of full cycle design process. To put the user at the center, remembering that, as Steve Jobs says, Design is very much, it's about functionality, it's about service, if it's about performance. So design isn't just what it looks like and feels like. It's not just that end product. Um, it's not how pretty your email looks, right? It's how does it work? And it's not how does it work for me? Did I say what I want to say? Do I feel good about this? It's how is it going to work for the person who's actually going to use this email. That concept of usability is really so key because people are not just receiving your email, they are using it to do something. And they're using it to do something that you have in mind because you've written that email with an intent. You want an action to happen as a result. Maybe you want to get something approved. Maybe you want a procedure to be done. Maybe you want a piece of information. Um, maybe you want to try to patch up a misunderstanding that happened at the last Zoom conference where we all know you can't read body language completely and, and so on. Um, so you have an intent and an action in mind. And so you need to think about how that email will enable your user to do that action. So when we start thinking about usability, that means that you put the reader at the center of your whole design process. And this is how you know that you have a usable, user-friendly email. Usable emails are quick to write because even though you're going through this design process, you have a key to your decision making. The audience becomes your guide. So instead of just wondering, oh, is that clear? Or, oh, does that feel right? You have some questions that you can ask about your audience to guide your decisions. Uh, usable emails both grab and keep the reader's attention. So emails that are writer focused do not get those results. They get missed. They, they go to the bottom of the inbox. Those that are user centered go to the top. They are crafted for ease of reading and ease of skimming. So that means that you put as much or more time into thinking about how you are saying something even how it looks on the screen uh, versus just thinking about what you want to say. So the emphasis of your, or the distribution of your time kind of changes a little bit. Uh, and finally, a usable email, one that produces results, really emphasis, emphasizes content that has a high WISM factor. You may have heard that before. What's in it for me? So instead of thinking again about what is it I want to say, what is it I want to achieve, it's what do I want to enable my reader to do? Um, quick poll where you can use your little hand icon again. How many of you here are either team leads or managers? I just would like to get how many of you are in, in some sense enabling other people to to get things done. Okay, great. So we have quite a few green check marks and hands here. You know, when you when you move from being um, an entry level employee to being somebody who's in a managerial role, the mindset shift you have to make is that you're no longer just doing things, you are empowering others to get things done. It's kind of that same idea with email. We tend to think about it as, oh, I need to do this. I need to impart this information. It's really, how am I empowering my reader to get something done that I want to happen?
So I have a, a sample to share with you here. Now this is probably not the kind of email you would write, but that's intentional because what I'm doing here is putting you in the position of the audience. So you are the user here. I want to, you to imagine that you have inquired about a new service um, called the engineering to spec service. So I guess they create prototypes, let's say, um, and you have received back this email. So just take a minute to read it. And I would like to get um, your sense about um, how, how reader-centered, how reader-oriented you feel it is. So let's, actually, it would be great to have a quick um, kind of uh, score. So let's say that one equals very low on being user-centered and five equals very high. So just quickly give this a read and give it a score between one and five as to where you see it on the scale of being user-centered. Oh, I see some scores coming in. And we've got quite a range, going from one to three. One tells me that there are some things in here that are really potentially alienating. Oh, Marcel says it could be worse. Yes, it could be worse. Um, certainly it's a polite email. You know, it starts out, we've received your inquiry. There is some sense of being aware of the client. If you look at the second paragraph, it, you know, it refers to clients in certain sectors, um, and certainly there is clarity here, so it is clear, clear what the next step is. Uh, let me try to guess at some of the reasons that many of you have scored this less than three. Some of the things that I would pick out that would tell me this is more reader-centered than writer-centered um, are things like the first paragraph in which the writer is talking about how they're they're excited and they're excited about being in their home province uh, but really this needs to be oriented to what the reader is feeling which often we can't guess uh, not the writer's feelings by the same token in the second paragraph we see a reference to our clients so instead of addressing the reader as you which would have been more conversational and direct it's talking about clients also, it refers to clients in particular sectors. So depending on which sector you're from, that may or may not resonate with you. Um, and so that could actually be off-putting. Uh, what really has the potential to be off-putting here is the reference in the third paragraph to our intake process. So really what this email should be enabling the reader to do is to get ready for that next step. So that should be near the beginning, you know, thanks for your inquiry, your, your next step will be to meet with our head of design and here's, it work. here's how it works. So what's actually important to the reader is buried and it is presented as a process that belongs to the writer, it's our intake process, kind of focusing on the, the technical aspect of their workflow rather than on what the customer experience is here. So as you read through this, I'm just wondering, as you think back to some of those emails you wrote this morning, were there any inadvertent signals that you were sending that could have potentially uh, actually been alienating to your, to your reader? Design is a very intentional process. It doesn't happen by accident. A discovery, I think, can happen by accident. Uh, but design is very intentional, and for most of us, it requires a, a very conscious shift so that we're standing in the shoes of, of the reader. And I um, often talk about the need to get not just into the mind of your reader, but into the heart of your reader, because it's really important as you write your email to be thinking about um, kind of the state, the, the general state of mind and the emotional state of the person receiving your email. 
empathy plays a really key role. And yes, this is true, even when you are conveying very technical information. It's true because the people receiving your email are never robots. They are always human. And that means that they are coming to your email in the midst of their day, in the midst of what is a busy day, in the midst of many different pressures, they're bringing all of that to the screen. And so the more aware you can really be of what makes your writer tick, the easier it is to frame the information in a way that's going to feel accessible to them and that's going to engage them. So going back to thinking about email writing as a full-fledged design process, the first step in that process we saw was inquiry. Or sometimes you'll see ask or research. Again, there could be very different ways to frame this up, uh, but I'm using the word inquire. So it's so important before your fingers start typing, typing to take some time to inquire before you write. And you may be thinking, ah, who has time for this? I mean, I just have to react, react, react. Well, what you will find is if you start becoming more reader-centered and more intentional uh, about empowering your readers to act, yes, you will spend more time writing your emails. You will spend less time resending emails because somebody didn't respond. You'll spend less time putting out fires because somebody misinterpreted your email. And over time, this process of full-fledged design becomes intuitive so that you really, it just becomes natural that you would kind of take this moment to pause. So what are some of these questions you ask your audience? Well, uh, when I uh, coach people or um, deliver longer workshops, I often will present people with kind of a long list and actually a few different methodologies that you can use. But here are some, I might say, of the, the top 100 questions or the top hits. You want to ask, what keeps them up at night. Trying to get your email to the top of someone's inbox, particularly if they are, you know, higher up on the on the ladder from you, is so challenging. So you really need to connect your email with what matters to them. What keeps them up at night? What are their top values? What are their principles that, that they would not compromise on? This is an important one. What is their pet project or their main mission right now? Right? How many of you right now are maybe working for a supervisor and they have a pet project on the go or a main mission? Everything kind of comes down to this um, buzzword. Can anyone relate to that? Again, use your green check marks or your, um, your hand icon. I, I Thanks, John. I see a couple hands up. I recently worked with a client actually uh, who was involved with a city doing some transportation planning. I see your hand as well, Lee, thanks. And one of their comments was uh, this municipality was very, very interested in encouraging cycling. So it was like everything had to always relate to biking and bike lanes, right? That's really key to know when you're trying to get to the top of somebody's inbox. What pressures are they under? Uh, years ago, there was a famous article written in Harvard Business Review, How to Manage Your Boss. It's a fabulous article. And I remember one of the things those authors said was that very often what causes conflict uh, between um, somebody and their manager or their leader is that they're not aware of all of the pressures that somebody is under. And you need to be really aware of those when you're thinking about how to get your email so that it gets attention. And those of you maybe who have moved maybe even recently uh, into a managerial role, I'm sure you can relate to that. There are a lot of pressures uh, that you see and experience at one level that you're not as aware of at the other level. And of course, it goes the other way as well. You know, um, if you are at a very senior level, it's easy to forget about some of the pressures that someone might face at a younger level or a more junior level. What political entanglements uh, face them? What's their communication style? 
when and where will they be reading their email? I know when I did a lot of work with a big four consulting firm, I knew that very often if I was creating a document of any length, that the partner would be saving that for plane reading. <laughs> They'd be reading it on the plane, and so therefore maybe all those fancy hyperlinks that I planned to put in wouldn't, wouldn't work. Uh, what's their decision-making process and what's their authority? Key question to ask because what you want to make sure is that you put <clears throat> everything, you put enough in your email, enough information that will enable that person to make whatever decision you want them to make and enable them to act. And in some cases, that might mean writing an email so it's suitable for somebody to instantly share it, um, send it up, up or down the, the line so that you can get the action you need. So those are a few of the questions you can ask before you sit down to write. And even, actually I'll just go back to this for one second, what I'd encourage you to do is to maybe identify one of these questions that you're not asking now, just one of them, and see if it makes any difference this week, just trying to ask that question before you shape your email. And actually, I would love to hear in the chat uh, what particular questions are resonating with you. So if there's a particular question that you're going to start asking this week, um, I'd invite you to share it in the chat. That's great. Okay, so technology, as we know, is wonderful. It can also cause some interference and some hiccups. And that's exactly what I was going to say about email. Now, here's the thing about email, is that nobody, I don't think, really reads it anymore. It is actually a false concept if you think there, Nadia, maybe you could tell me if that's a little bit better. So what you need to do with emails is assume that people are not necessarily going to read the whole thing. You want to design for skimming. So that means following some practices that may actually seem counterintuitive. And the first one is to state your reason for writing up front particularly if I'm a busy manager or busy uh, leader, I want to know right away, does this really deserve my attention? Is there something time sensitive? Is this just a, an FYI? And I really discourage people from sending FYI messages. Um, why should I bother, right? That's the question. It means using short paragraphs. So you may have let's say a, a progress report that you've written as a Word document and your boss says, oh, can you just send it to me in an email? You can't just cut and paste from that Word document into your email. You need to reformat so that it's easier to skim. That means short paragraphs. It means headings. It means using things like boldface and color so that you are directing your audience's attention to specific things that you don't want them to miss. It means asking direct questions. Very often when people don't get a response to an email, I'll say, well, did you, did you ask about that? <laughs> did you ask the question? And when you ask a question, think about placing it somewhere where it's very emphatic. And typically that's the end of the paragraph or in its own paragraph. And finally, because people tend to be skimming, you want to actually reiterate important information um, at the beginning and at the end. When you are writing an email, you also want to be presenting solutions, not problems, and you want to make it easy for the reader to arrive at a decision or take action. So if you are in the habit of thinking that people are reading your emails, shift to thinking about people skimming, and that right away will get you into some of these habits. Now that doesn't mean that there will be readers who will go through line by line by line, but you have to grab their attention, show them why it's really worth their reading, and for most people, design for skimming. So here's a before and after example that I'll share with you. 
Um, these are emails created by me. So if there are technical things in here that don't make 100% sense, let me know. I'll fix it for next time. Uh, but yes, they are not they are not written by an engineer. They are modeled on a lot of email writing I've seen over the past 20 years or so uh, from engineers and software developers. So you can see here it starts off, hi Kai, as we enter the final phase of the MB project, here are a few updates. And then what we get is essentially a story. You know, for starters, there's this, there's the paving, there's the painting, testing could be an issue, fill you in on Tuesday. So I'm really curious to know what kind of changes you might make to this email. What comes to mind? Oh, I see Corey and Daya are typing. Looking forward to hearing your suggestions. What would you change? Give some exact, exact dates. Hard to make a decision if you don't have precision. Yes, very good. Um, Corey says, less stream of consciousness. Yes, that is a really good way to describe what happens when an email has not gone through an intentional design process. The writer writes down ideas either as they occurred or as they occurred to them in their head. Some non-relevant issues, Saeed says. Could be a bulleted list, so Iwa, that's thinking about skimming. Thank you, and I see Natalie emphasizing that as well. And Marcel, right, yeah, so a bulleted list can be a, a, great, a great tool to use. Make sure when you're using a bulleted list that it truly is the information that's most important in the message. Sometimes what happens is people will bullet a list and it's, it's not actually where you want the eye to go first. So whatever you put in a bulleted list, boom, your reader's eye will go there. So here um, are actually uh, the changes that I made. Um, you'll see I didn't actually use a bulleted list this time, but that could definitely be an option. I chose to use some headings, and I also chose to use, in this case, color to identify questions that I needed answers to. And you'll notice that right up front, I've indicated the purpose of this message, I haven't just said there are a few updates. There are a few updates that could impact the timeline. So that should raise a red flag up the pole for the manager here. Uh, oh, I better pay attention to this. And then the um, questions are in blue. Of course, I would want to make sure that the person is uh, reading this. Maybe does not have any uh, vision issues. Um, that can that can sometimes be problematic. Um, so you can see I've just broken this out. Paving, that's done. Inspection's happening on July 10th. Painting, that's happened. Question, do I let Bob know about the new date? Um, and somebody suggested uh, maybe we put a precise date up here instead of saying up to two weeks. Uh, testing of tension wires. Okay, here's the problem that Julian may not be able to um, complete this. Uh, but here also is the start of a solution. And this hyperlink for Adriana Lutsky would actually go to her company profile or her LinkedIn profile. So there's actually information there that the person needs to make the decision, Kai needs to make the decision. And then there's actually a suggestion of working towards that solution. Uh, Marcel, good point, but that personal information. So I would assume that this is information that is appropriate to disclose, um, may not be necessary. This is a really, um, that kind of detail is a really interesting call, isn't it? Um, very often when you're giving bad news of any kind, you want to make sure that the rationale for it is clear whether or not we need this much detail here would be a question and it really has to do with how well you know the audience and and so on and Saeed I say I see you're about to weigh in as well so it'd be good to hear your comment okay. just mention a family reason yeah that that could be perfectly that could be perfectly fine yeah and then that would tighten up the email 
make it easier for somebody to read on a device. Yeah, great suggestions. Um, so as you look at some of the strategies here, again, my question would be, hmm, which of these strategies might you try? Uh, particularly if you have a situation where you have somebody, it could be a client, it could be a manager, it could be a leader, whose attention is very hard to get. Are there any tips or strategies you see here? Now, did this email start out this way? Not actually. Very often when we sit down to write at the keyboard, we have this kind of stream of consciousness. We dump it all out. That is perfectly okay. If you think about the design process as being iterative, that will be key to making your email writing more efficient. So one thing I do with emails is um, I typically don't put the name in the subject line until I'm ready to send. And I assume that my first pass is not going to be the actual email that goes out. So I, I intentionally allow for that design process. And very often I will just kind of spit out the ideas and then to me, they're like building blocks. Then I can start structuring them in a way that's going to make sense, not to me, but to my audience. Now, is this going to take you more time? For most people it doesn't because many people when they sit down to write are very stymied. They get stuck. They don't know what to say. Does anybody kind of find it hard to maybe start off an email right away, particularly if it's kind of a challenging email, maybe it deals with a delicate issue. So anybody besides me deal with writer's block? Okay, I'm seeing a few hands and check marks. So if that's you, really a big key to improving your email efficiency is not trying to get it right the first time. You don't get a design right necessarily the first time. There's that iteration. So get the words out, discover what it is you, you want to say, and then step back and say, how do I present this in a way that will make sense and be very accessible, very usable for my audience? All right. So um, pause here and just encourage you to um, raise any questions or comments, objections <laughs> that you have in the in the chat box. While you're while you're thinking about that, questions that might be coming to mind, maybe reflecting back on those emails you've written earlier today and thinking about, hmm, is there something I could have done differently? Um, we'll start diving into some of the common, common mistakes that get made, particularly in writing that deals with very technical topics. Okay, the number one mistake I would say is assuming that your reader is as interested in your email as you are. <laughs> um, and uh, I think of this kind of grumpy cat as actually being most of us when we sit down to read emails. I don't know about you, but I am not always really enthused when I go to my email after lunch. It's like, ah, oh, 50 new email messages, 20 new email messages, right? Um, so on the other hand, the emails that I write, I put a great deal of care and thought into. I'm very invested in them. So assume then that you have to grab your reader's attention. And so that means pay very close attention to your subject line. And as Marcel says, you've got to get to the point. So we don't want to omit context. We'll get to that in a minute. But we want to make sure that we show our reader right up front why they should care. So a very specific and a concise subject line that creates a sense of urgency. So not one that uses a red flag or uses urgent in all caps. That doesn't always work. Um, but I love Marcel's acronym. Bottom line up front. Bloof. Love it, Marcel. Thank you. Check out the chat, uh, folks, if you haven't seen that yet. Yes. 
So indicate why it is that you are writing. That might mean in a report actually giving your key finding up front and then explaining how you got there. It might mean if you're asking for approval, noting up front, I'm writing this because I need your approval by Tuesday, and then giving the background and so on. Um, make sure that your, your, your subject line hooks your reader and that your first line keeps hooking them, that you have that clear purpose statement. You don't want to make your reader play detective because that, it, again, it, this is the, the second um, mistake I would say, and that means uh, burying your main point and saving a request till the end of your message. So uh, Marcel has already gotten us to this point. Um, don't be afraid to repeat a request at both the beginning and the end of your message because we think of somebody scrolling very quickly on their phone. They're going to look at the beginning. They're going to go down to the signature to see, oh, does anybody want anything from me? So if you've asked up front, you've indicated your ask up front, make sure that you repeat it. And boldface. Sometimes people are really nervous about using a bit of boldface. I just asked for a show of hands. How many people here routinely used either boldface or color in email messages to draw attention to key information? Oh, I see some people. Great. Some people are a bit nervous about doing that because they're worried that, well, maybe it will seem like shouting at somebody, um, or maybe it will seem too bossy if I'm writing for the boss. So you want to use this very strategically and very selectively, uh, but boldface does not have the same impact as all caps. All caps does look like shouting and years ago that was actually what was called shouting and so it's a convention that's been established um, but um, yes bold can work can work very well and most busy people appreciate it when you bold face things like a meeting date for instance okay. so um, here's an example that I wanted to share of share with you of a very simple networking email. And I've included it because it makes some writing moves that really orient this to the reader. So there are some very subtle moves made here uh, that are designed to grab the reader's attention, attention and show that it's in the reader's best interest to read this. I've included this networking email rather than another kind of project management email because of course ultimately email is about building relationships and when you think about the kind of writing that accelerates your career uh, sometimes it is um, these connection emails that make a big difference so as you take a look at this i'm just be curious as to what jumps out at you and signals to you that this is really designed to grab and keep the reader's attention Thanks, Iwa. So Iwa notes that there's a personal connection. Right. So there's uh, the memory of when we last met regarding the NSERC application, and then actually um, the personal connection, um, Hayden Henwood's daughter. Uh, this is not an exact email I sent recently, uh, but it's very, very similar. And it got an instant reply. Anything else that jumps out? I see Natalie and uh, Megan and a few others are weighing in. Natalie says, tips for remembering the connection. That's right. So not just we met when we worked on NSERC, but you may remember me as Hayden Henwood's daughter. Right. Okay. How this contact is beneficial and that you are on my mind. Right. Yes. So... Actually, when I wrote this email, I had just met uh, somebody uh, who had just recently come to Halifax, 
and he was on my mind because I wanted to help him and I wanted to help him because he's a friend he's my, my a friend's husband so actually I'm writing this uh, with uh, Sam's interest in mind but I need to get Phil's attention and so I phrase this thinking Phil you're on my mind because here's something valuable for you and then notice that instead of just saying uh, Phil I'd like to you know I'd like to introduce you to Sam that I actually am doing a little bit of a sales job here building some intrigue and saying here's why you should pay attention to this message um, obviously I have in my head that Phil has been looking for somebody with expertise in geothermal assessments and so on um, and so here's why you should look at Sam um, and Megan I see that yeah you're on my mind today do you know one of the things I try to do with email is I try to think how would I word this in person or on the phone right and so I'd probably say something like you know I was thinking of you or you know you came to mind today uh, because that's actually what what happened and yeah so this person is really skilled you as you say so this is part of kind of selling I'm selling what I have to say before I say it now this is in a networking context this happens in many contexts um, so keep that in mind you're, you're really kind of continually engaging your reader and then notice that I have again included a hyperlink here so this would go directly to Sam's LinkedIn profile so what I've done by that is I have given Ka, uh, Phil the information that he needs in order to make a decision so he can just quickly click on Sam's profile and decide yes or no I want to follow up um, with Sam. <laughs> you, uh, that, that, well, I don't think that shouting applies in chat. That was good emphasis. <laughs> that was good emphasis. And I saw somebody's note earlier as well, uh, noting kind of bold, bold face and how that translates into plain text. So important when you're writing to be thinking about uh, when the person's going to be reading it and what device they're going to be reading it on. I think we've, I remember years ago teaching a class and the person in this class said well my boss will not read anything more than about this, the length of a tweet right um, because he reads everything on his e on his blackberry so things like that can really challenge us um, with email and how do you deal like that with that well in that case you may end up writing very short emails with attachments it all comes down to your audience and what will work for them uh, so the third mistake uh, we are looking at five is omitting background so we've been talking about getting to the chase and making sure you don't uh, bury your main idea it can be just as big a mistake to actually leave out critical background so don't assume that your audience will recall events and information that are fresh in your mind so in that email we just saw I didn't just assume that Phil had been thinking for the last however many months about how we work together on that NSERC application. I, I gave that little other bit, but remember, I'm Hayden Henwood's daughter, and we had this big hugging thing, and <laughs> it, was, it was quite a story for another time. Um, so, and also, don't fall into the trap of assuming that your audience shares your perspective on a particular issue. Remember, one of the questions we want to ask is kind of what political entanglements might they be involved in that you don't see? What pressures might they face that you don't see? So what you want to include is a background section that's very easy to access. Um, might be a great point to put in some of those bulleted points if you have to give a quick chronology. But you also want to make it easy to skip over if your reader doesn't need it. And very often when you are writing an email in a large organization, you may be writing for people who are, let's say, at, at your level. Um, and then you may also be writing for somebody who's in the C-suite. So the person in the C-suite may need some background because maybe it's been a while since he's been oriented, he or she has been oriented to this topic. But on the other hand, the person you've just been chatting with this about over lunch, they don't need that background. So if you use headings and you have uh, sections, that makes it easy for everybody to skip. And framing is a topic for a whole other, whole other uh, discussion, but Framing means taking the time early on to really place the situation or topic into perspective for your reader. Um, 
So in that earlier email, we saw about the bridge, you know, indicating up front that there was a timeline issue. That gives it a certain kind of framing. Um, the example that I gave about the municipality that was so interested in bike lanes and cycling, you know, framing would be necessary in order to get an idea in front of them. It would have to be clear how that relates to the overall concern with bike transportation. Avoid, as mistake number four, overdoing technical details. Very often we think, oh, I better pack everything in this email just in case. Well, what you really want to do in terms of design is you want to be thinking, what is the minimal amount of technical detail that the reader needs in order for them to be empowered to take the action you want them to take? So that means including all of the relevant information, but no irrelevant information. And it may mean using things like hyperlinks or attachments if there's information that is nice to know, but maybe not need to know. And finally, uh, the last mistake is telling a story rather than structuring content thematically. We'll go back to Corey's idea about stream of consciousness. So rather than using um, chronology or using your priorities as the guide to structuring your document, uh, think about how you can restructure your content to make it very easy to process and make it easy to align with the audience's priorities. Not your priorities, but your audience's priorities. So is there part of your message that relates to that pet project or that mission? Uh, maybe that goes up front. And you really want to make sure that you make clear statements about the meaning of events and data. So you don't leave your reader ha hanging, you set them up to make the decision that needs to be made. So here's an example um, I'll leave you with. Again, it's a very simple project management uh, document and more simple than many of the documents you are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, but you can see that just with a few simple strategies here, this is very easy to process. And this could have very easily been one of those stream of consciousness emails. But instead, we start with a little bit of context. We had the meeting yesterday. Um, we have a purpose statement that indicates why the reader needs to pay attention, because it looks like you have a, an assignment coming to you, Emma, that you're going to have to schedule in your calendar. And then, um, rather than just using a bulleted list, we have organized this so it's very easy to process. We've organized it by themes. Here's how the research will happen. Here's how the drafting and revision will happen. Here's how the editing will happen. A little bit of bold face here makes it easy for Emma to spot key dates. There we go. So this may have taken Marty a little bit longer to write than if he had simply sat down and, and just after the meeting just said this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. But this is an email that has been designed for success. It's been designed to um, produce results. Emma's got the time blocked on her calendar. She understands exactly what's expected of her and what to do if she has any questions. People often uh, come to me um, for help because they want help with clarity. Clarity really comes from designing writing, including emails, not just to impart information, but designing it for effective communication, putting your reader at the center. When you do that, you design not just for clear communication, but you design for positive relationships. So I hope you have found a few tips here today that you can take back to your desk right away and start practicing. I'd love for you to think right now about just maybe one takeaway that you're going to take back. Maybe it's one of those five mistakes you're going to avoid. Um, and uh, if you would like a copy of this slide deck complete with the writing samples, just send me an email to dawn at dawnhenler.com. 
You don't need to put anything in the message, just use the subject line ENS email slides and we'll get the slides off to you today. Thank you so much for being here.